The message of Rumi is to be relentless. The message of Rumi is um, to ditch shame, is not to be so much, you know, so concerned about other people think of you, that to be more self-focused, which is really the message of enlightenment. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Hello, Savannah family. Welcome back to the show. It's time to travel. We're going to go back to the 13th century in this episode, and we're going to learn all about Rumi from award-winning translator and scholar of Rumi, Sharam Shiva. He's going to take us on a journey in this episode, and we're going to learn about Rumi's early life. How did he transition from a conservative teacher to poet that we love and know today? Why was Rumi's teaching so radical and so potent? And what about his teaching is still so relevant? Why are his poems still so beloved today? Definitely stay tuned and listen to learn more. My guest today is Sharam Shiva. As I mentioned, he is an award-winning translator and scholar of Rumi and the author of several books about Rumi and advanced spirituality. Before we dive into today's episode, I just want to remind you to support the show. And I have a really amazing opportunity on how you can do that in this particular time period, which is by purchasing the Uplifted Gift Box, the Uplifted Yoga Gift Box on SavannahSpirit.com. So as you know, Savannah Spirit is what makes the show possible. They have the most beautiful yoga clothing, jewelry, and crystals online. So you definitely want to check them out at SavannahSpirit.com. And now I teamed up with their team to make this really amazing gift box that's full of crystals and a little Ganesh, um, a crystal cleansing smudge set, a beautiful anklet, lavender incense, this really lovely moonstone mini gemstone bracelet that I wear all the time. It matches everything and Himalayan sea salts that you can use in the bath. It's just a really great care package for yourself or someone you love. It's normally $120 and right now it is way on sale. It's $59 and you can use that coupon code take 25 if you've never purchased anything on savannahspirit.com as a new customer take 25 for $25 off as well taking the price down even further so this is a really amazing opportunity to grab this gift box so I encourage you to do that now and you'll be supporting the show as you do all right now let's dive into all things roomy let's get into this week's episode Sharam thank you so much for coming on the show It's my pleasure. Oh, my goodness. Well, I was telling you right before I hit record about how excited I was to learn more about Rumi. I've always wanted to have someone talk about Rumi on the show. So for listeners who aren't familiar, can you just tell us who Rumi is, why they should care? Just give everyone a little context. Rumi was um, born in the 13th century. And uh, that's actually a very important era, that whole 800 years ago. It was an era of... um, a shift or an or a spiritual upgrade um, happened both in the east and the west, but it primarily happened in in the west uh, because Rumi, uh, although he wasn't Turkish, but he lived in an area that today is considered Turkey. Uh, his mausoleum is in Turkey, but he was uh, Persian. He was born in the Persian Empire, far away from Turkey uh, in today's Afghanistan. But his his family migrated there, so. Um, The shift that Rumi brought uh, was, at that time, was really earth-shattering. He is uh, is a mystic, he is a philosopher, he's sort of the Nietzsche of Middle East, um, and um, his message is exceedingly all-inclusive, and that's another thing that also um, stands out about Rumi. Uh, Part of the reason for his popularity in the West is the fact that he has been able to um, touch and reach out to people from all, you know, diverse backgrounds and cultures and so forth. So when he was growing up, what was the sort of atmosphere, like the current status quo at this time in the 13th century? And then what was the breakthrough that he sort of offered, the paradigm shift? Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious what you said about like how it was a time of change. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so he was born um, in an era that was very close to, you know, in an area that was very close to China and 
uh, and India and, and uh, so forth. And around that time, the big Mongol invasion started. This was a uh, major overtake of all of Asia, uh, including, you know, with all the way to what's today considered like Syria, like really almost, you know, really close to the Mediterranean and, um, and all of Turkey and all that. So this massive invasion was just starting. So his family who were living in um, that area uh, at that time, they decided to flee. And he was born into a very wealthy, highly educated um, uh, tribe. And um, so the entire tribe, the Rumi's tribe, they, they decide to fled the invasion of Mongols. And um, this was a group of, you know, multi-families, but about 40 to 50 people. And um, so that initially displaces Rumi. And after traveling for, for uh, quite a while, they uh, come into this town that uh, still exists today. It's called Konya, that later on becomes part of Turkey, that had a very uh, prominent university, and his father was a uh, professor. So, uh, and they were very welcoming of Rumi's family, especially of his father, who was considered to be a, he was a court advisor when he was in Afghanistan. That time was part of Persian Empire, and uh, and so forth. So he was, um, they, they decided to settle in Konya, and, and his ancestors are still, I mean, his um, uh, offsprings are still in Konya, by the way, which is very interesting, 800 years later. So what happens at that time is that he ends up having a very conventional, proper, um, scholarly um, upbringing. And uh, when he was 24 years old, his father, who was the head of the clan, his clan, passes away. So at 24, Rumi becomes the head of his clan, which is quite, you know, a, an accomplishment, really. And, uh, and, and at that time, he was also given a chair at this prominent university in the town. So he becomes a superstar uh, scholar, professor. He was very charming. He was, uh, he was of the nobility. So, you know, the, there was, they had access to... Um, all the powerful families in Konya. The ruler of the region was one of his students. Rumi was known at that time to teach classes of 400. That's how popular he really was just a superstar teacher. And all, and he lives this life of a very, um, you know, very kind of a specific, sober uh, scholar until he's almost 40 years old. And then everything <laughs> turns upside down. Oh, my gosh. So what happens? So when he's about 37, a wild, wandering dervish walks into his life. And this, uh, he, this dervish was also Persian. His name is Shams. And uh, Shams... Um, uh, the meaning of the word is the sun. So, you know, S-U-N. Uh, and Shams was the polar opposite of Rumi. So Rumi is from the uh, nobility, political power, wealth, hangs out with the ruler, on and on and on, right? And, and Shams was, for all intents and purposes, a homeless person, it's, it, because these are... Um, there's a tradition of wandering uh, dervishes in Persia who were re uh, were renunciants. They didn't own anything. They didn't live anywhere. They just went to place to place. They wore a very specific type of clothing that distinguished them as being this particular type of a group of dervishes. And um, they basically begged and kind of lived their lived a life on the fringe of society as a renunciant. So here you have polar opposites coming together and their meeting was quite a bit of a uh, shock to Rumi because they have a very simple back and forth conversation and that triggers something in uh, Rumi. Basically, Shams in a way awakened Rumi, spiritually awakens him because Rumi was very ready for this. There are a lot of stories how this happened, but almost all of them are made up. Be interesting story for children or whatever. I don't want to get into it. But what Rumi does is that he brings Shams into his household. So can you just imagine 
what that would create. Even today, if somebody in like a big Beverly Hills mansion would bring like one of LA's transients or whatever, you know, into their, their home, especially if they come from a super conservative, very well-established family. Right off the bat, this creates a massive amount of disturbance with, within the household. That's a whole other conversation that, that I talk about on Rumi's Untold Story, which is both on one of my sites called Rumi.net and also in a book that I did. So I don't want to get into it. But what happens then is that Rumi, Shams, Rumi and Shams get together. They kind of leave, depart from society. They, he, Rumi stops teaching. He stops interacting with his family and devotes himself to um, being educated by, uh, by Shams in the art of the ancient, mystical, uh, an, uh, ancient mystery schools, such as the one from Egypt and the, uh, the big um, leader of that movement is Toth, T-H-A-T-H, and, um, and ancient Persian schools and, um, and experiential uh, spirituality and so forth. So that was an amazing revelation for Rumi. So I think when a lot of people hear Rumi, they think poetry. And I'm sure there's a lot more to, to the story than that. How does this story that you've told us so connect with what I think a lot of people, especially who do yoga, have an experience of Rumi today, which is usually through his his writing, right? Yeah, um, yeah, how, through, through his poetry. Where did poetry come yeah, from? Yeah, where, where did that fit in? When you described his early life, it was very focused on like logical things and university studies and teaching. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited. Like how does, how does that all happen? Right. Well, in Rumi's own words, Shams transformed him from a, you know, bookish, sober scholar to an impassioned lover of spirituality and universal truth. So Rumi and Shams spent a very, very short period together. Rumi lived to be 66 years old and met Shams when he was, you know, 37, 38. All together, they only spent at the most 18 months together. And uh, the issues were revolving about, around, around, you know, about the, the again, the, the dichotomy of these two characters at an era where the ruling elite were totally separated from the merchant class and from the peasant class completely. They weren't allowed to associate uh, themselves. They weren't allowed to form friendships and so forth. So Shams's um, association with Rumi creates such mayhem and uh, such disturbance in uh, in that in the in the top families of the era that Shams, after just a few months, just disappears. He just, he was sick and tired of all the, all the negativity and how everyone was hating on him. So he just takes off. He, and, uh, and Rumi, you know, sends a whole caravan of gifts to invite Shams back and so forth. And Shams comes, it's a long story, I'm really shortening it. For people who want to read the details, just refer to Rumi's untold story. Shams comes back a second time and the second time doesn't work at all. And, uh, and then it turns into a major soap opera. It's super dramatic and involves honor killings and so forth. I'm not gonna get into any of that, but Shams gets killed. And after that point, Rumi falls into a very deep state of grief. And out of that deep state of grief comes 25 years amazing uh, poetry that is highly difficult to compose. And he was composing them verbally. Not that he couldn't write, he was a top scholar, but he was so, he tapped into a nerve, a, this universal creative nerves nerve that he would just put out this incredible amount of highly difficult to compose poetry one after another. So after 25 years, he has roughly about, you know, 30, 40,000 poems. I mean, it's an insane amount of, of, of output collected in two volumes. So the first volume is the one a lot of people are very much used to, that he, he devoted and dedicated to Shams. And that's, that's about the love poems, the ones that are super passionate, the ones that uh, are about um, kind of giving up everything for love and uh, has uh, very deep uh, spiritual elements, has some funny elements, has a lot of references to Shams. That takes 15 years, and that by itself is about 30, 40,000 verses. And once that's done, that was almost his um, kind of a self-therapy. 
to try to get over the loss of Shams and, and, and express and share what he learned from his couple of years overall, year and a half that he spent with Shams. And the last 10 years of his life, he decides to change gear. And although he was still sharing in poetry, he decided to make it to make his poems more approachable and more mainstream accessible. So he does another book, um, and this book is has a lot of anecdotes and simple stories and um, a much simpler kind of, in a sense, conversations about the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran. So this second book, <laughs> oddly enough, is actually a lot more popular than his first, the passionate books, because people, you know, mainstream people got to understand what Rumi was about a little bit. Whereas his first book, which has been my focus exclusively, I only focused on his first, The Passionate, um, is you have to be a spiritualist. You have to be mystic to grasp the hidden secrets in it. Whereas the second book, pretty much anyone can, can you know, grab it, can understand it. What are your big takeaways? I mean, because you've written so many books about Rumi and your your knowledge is so deep. I'm curious if you'd share with the listeners, like, what do you take away from this story? Like the story of someone who was such an academic and, and so incredibly intelligent and kind of devoted the first half of their life to kind of playing by the rules, right? The way you painted the story. So then just doing a complete 180 and it sounds like it's it's truly in a spiritual enlightenment or, you know, some people today might call that a kundalini awakening or, or just to suddenly he has this heart that's overflowing with love and then grief <laughs> and then this huge output of work. Like what is your takeaway for, for like all of us or what do you take away from this story as you think about how to live your life and you know, just sort of from, from your own spiritual perspective? Yeah, um, you know, I've been influenced by Rumi almost all my life, certainly all my adult, uh, adult life. And, um, and I've had the privilege of sharing Rumi for a very, very long time with, with the world and, and getting to know him at a level that previously was not available to the Western audiences. The message of Rumi is to be relentless. The message of Rumi is um, to ditch shame, is not to be so much, you know, so concerned about other people think of you, that to be more self-focused, which is really the message of enlightenment. And, um, and it is about um, also has elements of excellence um, because he's certainly his work is of a very high caliber. He's really on par with, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Shakespeare in the West. And... Um, and, and also, it's about dedicating your life to, to, uh, to personal growth, to spiritual growth. And when, and when that opportunity comes, don't take it lightly, because that is the most important uh, aspect of being human, is personal spiritual growth. It's not just survival, it's not reproduction, it's not just having a job or whatever, you know, so... That's uh, so. So these are these are um, some of the takeaways. We can also talk about love. Why do mystics um, put such emphasis on love? I mean, that's another topic that we can certainly talk about because a um, lot of uh, Rumi's message, especially the ones that are popular in the West, um, revolve around uh, the concept of love. Do you see similarities between what was happening then in the 13th century and what's happening in our modern world today? Yes, yes, yes. There, um, 2,000 years ago, at the time of Jesus, was a major uh, upgrade. It was an, um, an era of massive shift. And 800 years ago, 13th century, at the time of Rumi, era of massive shift as well. What Rumi did, one of many things, but one, of the, one, one thing that he did was that he um, came up with, with a statement that at that time was earth shattering. He said that... Um, God is in your heart. This statement is very common today, and we don't even, you know, pay attention to it. But eight, but eight hundred years ago was um, really it was a it was a major it was a major statement. That's because when you know in uh, the um, the um, the Jewish Torah and in the New Testament, uh, God is an outside uh, entity, meaning there is a separation with, between God and man. And, uh, and what Rumi did was that he fused the outside deity with man. 
So he brought us one step closer to the era that we are in today, uh, which is also another massive upgrade uh, period, that, um, there, that you are the deity. There is no outside deity. Yes, there is universal energy, but you are the deities. And the sooner you realize and the sooner you grasp this concept, the quicker will be your your uh, growth and soul evolution. Had Rumi been religious pr- earlier in his life? Yeah. And what religion was he? V- uh, he, was, uh, he was Muslim. So it was a huge change of faith, essentially. If Rumi was a peasant class or a merchant class, he would have been executed for blasphemy. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the reason he got away with a lot of the things that he said, like, you know, God is not found at any place of worship. God is not found at the mosque. God is not found at, at Kaaba. Um, I, you know, all of that. So he has so hundreds and hundreds of blasphemous uh, poems. Actually, uh, Rumi is not even allowed to be mentioned in places like Saudi Arabia because he is considered, you know, counter the teachings of the of their of their prophets. Um, and traditionally, and even today in, in very Islamic places like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, um, they actually execute people for, for, for blasphemy today. So 800 years ago, you know, again, he got away with it because the ruler, the emir, was one of his students. So he was above the king, meaning he was above the military, certainly above the, the, the big mosque and the, and, the, and the clerics. So, and his work survived. Um, another thing that could have happened was that these kind of establishment clerics could have deleted a lot of his blasphemous texts, but nobody dared to touch his work because he was so respected as an individual. Wow. So, Savannah family, when we come back, we're going to continue this this conversation and we're actually going to look at some of Rumi's poems, which I'm really, really excited to do with an expert. Before we go and and pick up next time, I just want to make sure that everyone, um, Sharam, knows where to find you. So can you just tell them a little bit about your most recent book and where they can find you online? And, and he'll be back <laughs> in the next episode. Yeah, um, uh, uh, I, I have basically two sites. One of them is myfullname.com. But that is a little bit difficult for people to type, but it pops up on Google. But it's either sharomshiva.com or just go to rumi.net, R-U-M-I.net. And that's my Rumi network and there's contact information there and links to social media and so forth. Perfect. So I'm going to put both those links below in case between now and the next episode you want to look up some of his books or dive deeper. And Savannah family, I will connect with you all in the next episode. I'm super excited to go deeper into Rumi and I hope you're enjoying this week's theme. You've been listening to the Savannah podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah podcast.